what I'm going to do is a little bit different compared to other Genesis studies. I'm going to be reading the entire passage that we're going to comment on today first, and then after that, I'm going to break it down. Because believe it or not, this passage is rich with many things to study. There's a lot of confusing parts. Now, when you look at this uh, text, there's a lot to dig up here. And if you especially concentrate on the underlying words, it brings up some questions in mind. So there's a problem here. Jacob, okay, he's a man, he's a weak man, wrestled with God. Now, obviously, he would lose, but and prevailed. He beat God. God did not let him lose. Now, that's very important right there, is that God would want him to win, and that makes you wonder why. So, uh, is God weak? Another thing is, if he wrestled with God himself, shouldn't he die? Because God is divine. You cannot see the face of God and live. Then God touched the hollow of his thigh, whatever that means. Who knows what that means? The sinew on it shrank. So, we can guess thigh, we can guess sinew, but we don't get these parts. There's a lot to dig up from the, uh, just this passage. Let's go to Genesis 32, 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Recall that Jacob, uh, he's left all alone now. He sent over his uh, wives, his children, and everything on the other side, so he was left alone. Now remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word in the verse. So make sure when you hear my explanations, look at the verse and see if it all matches. Okay, that's how you're going to grow and understand the Bible. So the next part that I'll be explaining, once he was left all alone, over at that location there, he wrestled with a particular man all, the, all night long until day broke, until day, uh, daylight broke. Uh, broke. In verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him. So when God sees that he wasn't able to win against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. So God touched something hollow in his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. Now, the hollow of Jacob's thigh got out of joint. So how can you get out of joint by touching that? As he wrestled with him, as God wrestled with him, Jacob. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. So God says to Jacob, hey, let me go because daylight's coming. Daylight's breaking. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Jacob, he responds, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me first. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. God says to uh, Jacob, what's your name? And Jacob answers, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. So God says, your name is no longer going to be Jacob. It's going to be Israel. And Israel means a prince. That's what it means. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. So God defined the name Israel. You're named Israel because you're a prince that has power. Why you're a prince with power is because you had power with God and with mankind, and you were able to win. You beat. You beat God. That's what it sounds like. Verse 29, And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob asked God and says, uh, Can you tell me, I'm, I beseech you, so I pray thee is a request, obviously. I request, uh, can you tell me your name? And God says, what's my name to, to you? Why would you ask for my name? And God just blessed him there and left him. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. So Jacob says, uh, I'm going to call this location, this place where I wrestled with God, Peniel. Because he defines Peniel. I saw God face to face. That's what it means. Also, he says, uh, my life got saved and my life is preserved. 
That's what verse 30 says. Verse 31, and as he passed over Penuel, so uh, notice right here the wordings. Now that's not strange with Penuel, Peniel, or something like that. Uh, I don't know if other editions of the King James Bible might uh, preserve the I instead of switching it to you, but the idea is, remember, during the ancient times, everybody, when they were going uh, by pronunciation of a name or a place, not all of it is exact. Sometimes one person might call the place Peniel, and then the other person might call it, you know, Penuel, because the pronunciation is kind of, uh, it's kind of short, it's kind of close. So that's just very normal that time. And then if you give it a hundred years, obviously the name of a certain location or a person could totally change because the language and culture can keep evolving and keep changing through pronunciation and time. Okay. So as evolutionists can see, we do believe in evolution. All right. So then notice right here at verse 31. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So as uh, Jacob passes over Penuel, the, the sun uh, rose up on him, so it's shining down on him, and notice that he's halting on his thigh. So because it was out of joint, remember. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day. So because of Jacob halting on his thigh where it got out of joint, it was therefore, it's from that time forth, the Jews or the children of Israel never ate from the sinew, that's the muscle, that shrank. So apparently a muscle part shrank, that, uh, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day. So Notice the location where this uh, muscle that shrunk is located. It's on the hollow of the thigh all the way to this day. Because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Why don't the Jews eat that portion, that muscle portion? And that's actually true. Uh, they don't eat that muscle part, that meat part. The reason why is because God touched that hollow uh, in Jacob's thigh where uh, it's in the sinew, where the sinew is at, which shrank. Okay, what, is, what does all that mean? Now, let's come to this. We're going to have a little bit of fun here. Okay, let's come across solution number one. Solution number one. First of all, you can't look at God and live. Remember that, all right? You can't look at God and live. So how do you resolve that controversy? How do you resolve that scenario? Well, the first thing is this. One, we can see from this case, it's not God himself in his full manif uh, manifestation, in his full glory. God manifested in the flesh, as we've read in 1 Timothy 3.16, so they saw Jesus is in Jesus God himself. Yes, Jesus is God himself, but notice that the people didn't die. Why? Because God manifests himself in a form where these people can be able to look on him and live. He didn't just uh, reveal his entire glory. Now, this manifestation is very powerful in proving that God has, quote unquote, an image. Now, Jews, they accuse us, you believe Jesus is God. Yes, well, God has no images. Well, how are you going to explain the Old Testament here? Yeah. Show them Genesis. Jacob fought with God. How are you going to explain that? Yeah. Unless God manifested himself in the flesh. That's the thing. True, God is not an image, all right? But he can take upon the image of a man. He can do that if he wants to. Okay, uh, let's look at... Hosea 12, Hosea 12. So notice, this is evidence that Jesus is God, actually. Amen. This is evidence of the incarnation of Christ. Go to Hosea 12. Notice the timing of the rain and us arriving in church, you know. <laughs> the Lord's in control of everything, amen. The Lord just times everything right. And then as soon as service is over, we'll be able to go outside in the sunshine. You, you hear that, Lord? Okay, so <laughs> Hosea 12, Hosea chapter 12. 
You know what the answer is? It was the angel of the Lord. That's what you have to understand. It was the angel of the Lord. Look at Hosea chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 2. Verse 2. The Lord hath also a controversy with Judah and will punish, notice, Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and by his strength he had power with God. All right. Yea, he had power over the what? Ah, there's your answer right there. So there, we got the answer. God is actually the angel. But it ain't no ordinary angel because angels are not to be worshipped. So this is no doubt not just an angel. God equals not just angel, but angel of the Lord. That's what we call it. The angel of the Lord, when you look it up in the Bible, quite often it would refer to God. Now sometimes, perhaps, sometimes when you look at the angel of the Lord, it may refer to a, just a normal angel. Angel. I can give the benefit of the doubt. I can, uh, I can yield to that. But what you're going to notice quite often, and it's undeniable, there are times the angel of the Lord is referring to God. That's why Jacob was able to live. Because God is the angel of the Lord, hence Jacob was able to live. Now, let's come across the other issue. The other issue is, how in the world did he beat God? There's no way you can beat God. No one can beat God. So let's first establish that fact. Let's establish the fact that Jacob knew he cannot beat God. He knew that. Because look at Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. And verse 30. Genesis 32, 30. Jacob knew he couldn't beat God. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. And what? My life is preserved. Jacob knew that his life was protected, saved. Why would he need saving if he's a big boy and he can beat God? Obviously, he knew that God let him win. All right? You ever played with a little kid, you know, foosball, you know, probably in the hallway? And then didn't Jared, you know, he lets little Joseph win. And then Joseph's like, I win, you know, I beat Jared, you know. And Jared's like thinking, yeah, I let you win, right? That's very true, right, brother? That happens probably. Yeah, he's probably saying it differently over there. So, but he ain't here, so I can say that. So, but that's the idea is that uh, the person, you can say that person did win, but that doesn't mean that person had the ability or the power to overcome the opponent. The opponent lets the other party win. So that's why the language is used, that he, Jacob prevailed against God. He was able to win. But that did not mean that he had the ability and he was more powerful than God. That's not what it meant at all. Here's another clue. Another clue is verse 25, obviously. 25 and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. Now, it, it takes a, you know, when you're breaking a person's arm where it, the ball and the socket can go out of joint, you have to put a little bit of force like that. But God, all he did was touch it, and they just went, oh, like that. So we can see right here that God is obviously, uh, he had the power to overcome Jacob. But he let him win. All right, so now we establish that fact. So let's come to solution two here. Solution number two is that God let Jacob win. Now, the next question is this. Why would God let Jacob win? You thought about that? Why would God let Jacob win? I mean, wouldn't it be better that God would win against Jacob to teach him a lesson? Why would he let him win? There's something about the nature of God that's important for you to understand. We're going to look at the book of Hosea 12 again. Go to Hosea 12 again. And then I want you to go to Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27.
Go to Hosea 12 and Isaiah 27. Now, this is the eye-opening part, okay? This one is going to be like, whoa, I never saw it that way. It just shows how brilliant your God is. Literally, everything he does is truly for a good reason. Amen. He has a lot of meaning behind the stuff that he does. So we have to see what those meanings are. And those meanings turn into really big golden nuggets and even conviction. First of all, look at Isaiah 27. Now notice what the Bible says about Jacob when we read verse 5. Verse 5. Or let him take hold of my what? Strength. Strength. Remember, Jacob... His name was changed to Israel, means prince. Why? Because he had power with God. He, he, had, he took on God's strength. Let him, so God says, let him take hold of my strength. Jacob took hold of God's strength. He was wrestling, taking hold on God's hands and his strength and wouldn't let him go. If you hold on my strength, what does the latter part say? That he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. God says the reason, uh, the reason why God wants you to take hold of his strength, that's what Jacob did, is so that you can make peace with him. That's good. Now, you ever, uh, the verses wrestled with God, right? Jacob wrestled with God. Yes. Have you ever had a moment you wrestled with God? Let me get, give an example. He's speaking to you in the preaching of the word of God. You wrestled with God? You went on the altar. God, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. You wrestled with God? Uh, you're praying. You're in tears. You're in a bad situation. You wouldn't let God go. You wrestled with God? You follow what I'm saying? That's the idea. Why? Because there's a controversy. There's a debate going on. And then they're trying to make peace with one another. Now, here's the thing. Well, then, uh, are you saying that I can debate with God that, I mean, isn't God, I'm supposed to yield to his will? Am I not to, supposed to follow his will and his guidance? Uh, that's very true, but I'll cover that part a little bit later, okay? Because that will come to the next part. So one by one here. First thing is, if we understand that's the meaning of wrestling with God, debating with God, then the idea is, is because there are some uh, issues with ourselves that need to be fixed. Because keep reading it, if, uh, so that you can make peace with him. Verse 8, verse 8. In measure when it shooteth forth, thou, God, will what? Thou wilt debate with it. That's funny. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. What's the context? It's obviously, it's obviously the nation of Israel, but God doesn't say the word Israel. He puts in verse 9, By this therefore shall the iniquity of what? Jacob, Jacob be purged. God put Jacob there for a reason, not Israel. Because that nation of Israel, their forefather Jacob, had the same issue. So when God was speaking to the nation of Israel, he was also looking, or the nation of Jacob, he was looking ahead and including their forefather as well. His sin had to be cleansed. And this is all the fruit, verse 9, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin. Did you read that? That struggle, that debate is necessary to clean up sin. That's why God lets Jacob win. You might say, why would God let Jacob win? It's so that a fight can come out. You cannot win unless there's a fight, right? When a fight breaks out, the fight is over your sin. And then God's like, well, why should I uh, free you from that problem, Jacob? Can you re do you realize that Jacob, when we looked at his life, he lived his whole life in his own secular humanist way of doing things, in deceptive ways, in hurting people around him. And he thought he could live and survive that way. God had to 
Uh, God had to put up a debate with him. I think you should reap what you show, uh, you sow. Uh, you got to be punished for this. Why should I let it go? And Jacob's like, oh, God, please. Uh, no, I mean, I, uh, bless me, bless me. And God's like, no, I can't bless you. You messed up, you know. Uh, Proverbs 1, I will laugh at your calamity. Ha, 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 you deserve it. But Jacob's weeping, he's sobbing, he's not letting God go, and he's debating and fighting and wrestling, wrestling. That's what God exactly wants. You might say, why? He wants Jacob to be broken. He's got too much of himself, so that's why he's still wrestling. God's like, oh, you don't want it bad enough. No, no, I want it bad enough. No, you don't want it bad enough. No, I want it bad enough, and God's breaking him. The proof is obviously at Genesis, he touched the hollow of his thigh. He got broken. His bones went out of joint. But there's something very eye-opening when you look at verse 27, okay? When God breaks him. Notice the tendency and the character trait of God. I mean, you talk about uh, uh, a psychologist or something. Someone who knows the very depths of your heart and knows the exact questions to ask so that the true intentions, the feelings of the heart come out of your mouth. When you fight over your sin, the idea is so that you can become broken. Until you're broken. I mean, if you look at the Great Awakening revivals back then, especially the Cumberland Revival, uh, they didn't just uh, put tears on the altar and went back to their seats. They just, went, they just kept going until they broke. Until they broke. So until that wrestle, that debate with God is over. So then, looks like I'm really cut out, but can they read this? They can read all this? Okay. So then, they fight over, uh, God wants you to fight over your sin until you're broken, and then when you're broken, this is what he does with you. You ready for this? He asks you point blank. He asks you to break you as well. Now, that's the tendency of your God. Sometimes we don't really think until we're asked a question that relates to the very depths of our heart. Now, that was probably one of the biggest nuggets that you'll hear from this lesson, okay? So remember that. The reason why uh, questions are asked that aims the very depths of your heart is the best to finally get you thinking. Because when you're sinning, you're not thinking. When you're living your own way, you're not pondering your own way. It doesn't dawn on you. Your eyes don't get open until a question is asked that relates to the very depths of your heart. And the Lord has to do that sometimes. So, what does God say in verse 27? And he said unto him, what is thy name? What's the, what's the meaning behind that? What's the big deal? No, it has a lot of meaning. He says, Tell me who you are. Tell me your name. Because you know what Jacob means. Did you remember? Deceiver. God wanted Jacob to admit that. And he said, Jacob. Jacob had to say, you're right. I'm a trickster. I'm a deceiver. Not Remember back then at Genesis when he told his wives, God showed me a dream about these rams and, you know, my flock would outnumber your father's flock. No, stop putting God into the picture. Just admit it. You're a liar. You're a trickster. You're a sinner. We come up with a thousand excuses in our heads and unfortunately, like Jacob, we put God in that picture to justify our sin, our own way of doing things. But then when God finally has one-on-one -on -one time with you, and then you fight, you fight, you fight. Apparently, you think that the battle's over or should be done, but God doesn't think so. He says, you're not broken yet. Until you break, and then he'll also ask you. That'll open your eyes, and you go, okay, you're right. That's been my issue. You want evidence of this? Go to John, the last chapter of John. Didn't God do that with someone? He didn't ask him one time either. Did you notice that? Why would Jesus do that? Until your heart is broken. 
That's why. Notice the last chapter of John 21. John chapter 21. Notice that Jesus says at verse 15, and he's speaking to Peter. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. <coughs> so when they had died, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time. See, Jesus is not done. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Then what's, what did the next verse say? Peter was grieved. See, God asked until he broke. Why? It relate to his sin. He denied Jesus three times. God asked him three times. The question always relates to the heart. The question that God asked Jacob related to the heart of the matter. What's your name? To Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? The questions that are always asked that relate to the heart of the matter will finally break you of your fleshly nature. That's the eye-opening part right here. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 32. These become very, very powerful. These become very, very powerful uh, and life-changing. That's why God lets Jacob win. We understand that now, the debate, the struggle. It's to break you. Now, another matter is this. Another matter is not only God's intention for the person to win, to have a debate or struggle back and forth, is so that the person can be broken, but then it brings up that predicament, like I mentioned to you, is shouldn't we follow God's will? Because what if it is God's will for you to be punished, right? But Jacob wouldn't take a yes for an answer. I'll take the punishment. No, he said, and then he kept wrestling. And then God led him, and God honored it. So then that brings up a little bit of a question in our own prayer life, right? In our prayer life, we wrestle with God like Jacob, and we debate. But isn't the most important thing in prayer that things go by the will of God? Everything has to go by the will of God in prayer. Yes, no, and wait. It has to. It has to go that way. But why is it in these kind of scenarios, God can change the answer? God can uh, honor it too. It's not a bad thing. There's something that's eye-opening about this part. One thing we do know from the previous passages we looked, the intention was for Jacob to be broken and changed. If that was why God wants uh, the person praying to win, I wonder if that's the case in our own prayer life. The reason why God uh, would want the person to win in prayer is so that you don't change God's mind, but that he can change yours. Not to change God's mind, but to change your heart. Now, is there evidence for this? Let's look at Luke 11. <clears throat> Luke 11. When you pray, God actually wants you to keep praying until you change his mind. But in reality, it's not to change his mind. God's going to make sure it follows accordingly to his will. The idea is, is that it's done to change your heart. Because a lot of times when we pray over a troubling scenario, we don't realize how much we really want it that bad. Okay, so, Lord, take away this uh, health problem from me. Okay, great, but um, do you really want it that bad? And then if you really want something badly, your heart changes. Okay, so let's look at Luke 11, okay? We're going to see something here. Verse 5, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, 
and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. So notice that the answer is already given in prayer. No, I can't get up and uh, give you the bread or the food, okay? Don't trouble me, leave me alone. Can you picture God doing that to Jacob? Oh, God, uplift this uh, judgment from me. And God's like, no, no, you need that. It'll change you. So, I mean, think about it. It won't it change your life. So uh, let's leave it be. Uh, you need it. And Jacob's was like, no, God, no, no, I cannot let it go. And Jesus actually says that's what he likes to see. Because keep reading in verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. So notice right here that uh, God says that even though he wasn't going to answer the prayer or the request, in verse 8, because he is his friend and because of his importunity. In other, ones, in other words, he uh, kept persisting. Uh, he did not give up. Another passage that we can see, now keep your hand here, keep your hand here, go to Luke 18, okay? Keep your hand here, go to Luke 18. Notice another case of prayer that Jesus gives. So God does want wrestling in prayer. But the idea is it's not so that you, uh, that you have more authority over God. It's to uh, give disdain to his will, his authority, to disrespect it. That's not the case. It's because God wants to see your heart, how much you really want it. Uh, look at Luke chapter 18 and then verse 1. <coughs> and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. See, so they can't faint no matter what. They got to keep praying. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. And, God, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? So notice right here that God can answer the prayer of this particular individual because the individual will not give up. Although some people can say that uh, this is more of a tribulation application, the point is even though that might be a doctrinal application, that doesn't mean you can't get anything devotional out of it. The devotional aspect is undoubtedly that God hears children praying to him and you, as long as you keep wrestling with him, that he can grant your request. He wants that. Amen. Even if God says, uh, no, I'm not going to do it or I'm not going to grant it, Amen. he wants you to never give up and to keep praying. Amen. Why is that? Because he made a promise to you when you go to Philippians. Now keep your hand at Luke 11, all right? You can let go of Luke 18, but keep your hand at Luke 11. Go to the book of Philippians, Philippians. Okay, thank you, all right. Go to the book of Philippians. Uh, let me know uh, earlier next time, please. Okay, so up to here? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, here we go. That better? Yes, sir. All right, or up to here? That's perfect. All right, then. So I'll leave it here. Okay. So solution number three, it's talking about importunity in prayer, not giving up. God wants that. I'm assuming this spelling is right in the Bible, so he wants to keep seeing that importunity in prayer. Amen. Because he made a promise, and this is one of those promises that I usually quote when I pray. Look at the book of Philippians, and it's a verse that you memorized. 
chapter 4, verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Because God promised that he'll provide all your need. Now, when you go back to Luke 11, here's the idea. Look at verse 8. Okay? Keep your eyes peeled. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many, what? As he needeth, not as he, uh, God, my God shall supply all your needs, not all your greed. Not a desire, not a want, but a need. You don't realize that <clears throat> request you're giving, if that's really your need. How much you need it. Sometimes as you keep praying and praying, you'll realize that it's not really your need. And that it's more of the lust of the flesh and you'll change it. Or, it was a want at the beginning, but then through praying you realized how much it turned out to be a need. Amen. Okay, now, why? Because God promised He'll provide the need, but He also made a promise, I cannot grant desires of the flesh. Look at James. Look at the book of James. That's, the, that's why God will answer. It's because it's according to the need, not the desire of the flesh. The James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 2. James 4 verse 2. You got to understand this. God will never answer desires of the flesh. Now sometimes He'll answer desires. Don't get me wrong. But you have to realize that if it's according to the lust of the flesh, if it's not an actual need, if it's not something that aligns to His will, based on all these conditions, then He's not going to answer the request. He's not going to answer the request. God will never answer uh, desires of the flesh. So when you look at your prayer, is it really what you need? Maybe you need wrestling time with God. And as you wrestle, then you get broken a little bit more. And as your flesh gets broken a bit more, your eyes start to open a little bit. And then you realize what you needed. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 2. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, okay, so you ask in prayer and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. It's to please the desires of the flesh. Okay, go back. Well, how do I know it pleases the desires of my flesh or not? You need wrestling time. That's what wrestling time is for. You need to pray, debate, wrestle with God. And that way, as you wrestle, you recognize your condition a bit more. And then finally, God touches the hollow of that thigh where it goes out of joint. And then your eyes get opened a bit more. And you realize what you actually needed all that time. Not what you desired. All right, go to Genesis 32 again. Genesis 32. Now, I would like to ask you about uh, your prayer life. Is, is it really great? Is it really that great with God? Do you wrestle? Do you wrestle with God? Jesus said men always ought to pray and not faint. I remember at PBI when we would go to the prayer room, that was that verse up there. Men always ought to pray and not faint. And then uh, it gets you under conviction about wrestling and then spending time in prayer with him. I think I took a couple of our guys up there. Did I do that last time? Okay, then I have a bad memory, you know, so I don't remember. All I remember was that alligator that some of you guys want to chase after. So, so. In, uh, in our prayer life, we are to wrestle with God and keep wrestling, wrestling, and then you'll realize which one is truly a desire or truly a need. You'll see issues of the heart that you'll need to change. Prayer is done where it's not to change God's mind all the time, but more so to change yours. It's done to change your heart. Now, are there cases where God changes his mind? Sure, the, but there are passages that shows that. As a matter of fact, even people's fleshly desires, when they pray so hard, God would even grant it. 
And then people regretted those prayers that they did later on. So see, you can change God's mind in prayer. So I'm not a Calvinist. But there is one, uh, but Calvinists, you know, when they give statements, it's always half truths. It's not a complete lie. Can I say that again? That's the tricky, deceptive parts of Calvinism you have to be aware of. Because they do say something true and biblical. But it's a half truth, it's half biblical. Okay? So the true part with the Calvinist statement is in this part that prayer is not done to change God's mind, but more so to change your mind. Which is very, very true. But that's a half truth because they ignored the other half part. You can change God's mind without even changing your own mind. <laughs> the fleshly sinful part. That is possible. Okay. All right. Anyways, Genesis chapter 32. Have you noticed that the uh, past Genesis study and this Genesis study, that Genesis 32 should be probably one of the top recommended uh, chapters to study on prayer? Did you realize that? There's so much to glean just in this chapter alone. And God used the prime example of not a George Mueller, but a deceiver, yeah. a sinner, yeah. a person who's used to his own way of doing things. Right. Now that should be an encouragement to anybody's prayer life. Okay, now let's uh, see what's going on over here. When we look at verse 26 through 28, isn't it interesting that, uh, let's look at verse 25. He touched the hollow of his thigh and it went out of joint, right? Yeah, uh, what that caused is if you look at verse 32, notice the last part of verse 32, because he touched the hollow of, uh, excuse me, uh, not that one, uh, the verse 31, excuse me, verse 31, the last part. He halted upon his thigh. So notice right here that out of all places God had to touch, it was right here where he was standing upon. Now, why would he touch there? You know, there are plenty of places he could touch. I'll tell you what he could touch, his mouth. <laughs> Jacob was such a liar, it would do a lot of us good, you know, if he touched his mouth. I'm sure it would do the, even the Lord good, you know. He could have touched his brain, you know, he was just too smart and then just lived life uh, being a deceiver, you know. Maybe God could have just touched his brain or, you know, uh, made him, you know, more, you know, mentally slow or something. That way he can learn to finally trust God. That would be a nice place to touch. There's always a reason God touches a specific location. Go to Hosea 12 again, all right? Now, your hands can get away from all passages, okay? Hopefully, you're, you don't have five fingers on five verses, okay? Sometimes it's like that, so you have my permission to let them all go and go to Hosea 12, all right? All right. We'll go to Hosea chapter 12. Now, notice the wording right here. Read the passage again about Jacob, where he was able to prevail against God. Hosea chapter 12, verse 2. Now, when you read 2 through 4, everything that I talked about will seem to line up now. Verse 2, the Lord hath also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. That's why Jacob prevailed, because he had to clean out his sins first. God had a controversy, a debate with him. Wow. Now that verse makes sense, okay? But let's keep reading. God had to pay him back. Verse 3, ever since birth, Jacob was a problem. He took his brother by the what? Heel in the womb. That's why God hit it right there where on his foot he would be going like this the rest of his life. Why? God always does this if you know the, your Lord. He goes to where it all starts, the problem. Not the middle, not after, not the current problem of your current problem of what you're thinking. No, God goes to the deep root of the matter where you start, where you don't want to go. God always does that. So that's the reason why God um, touched the hollow of his thigh so that, you know, where he's, he has the problem because that's where it all began. He took the brother by the heel and God's like, oh, that's where you thought that you had everything. All right. Notice right here, verse 4, Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. 
He what? Wept and what? That means prayer. You know that? He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Uh, did, you did you find God in Bethel yet? Bethel means house of God. Now, obviously, the building is not the house of God, but you could take it in this sense is uh, basically God's talking about a location, a place and a location that was special to Jacob. That was God's house where he was able to find God and God was able to speak with him where he wept and uh, uh, where he wept and where he made prayer. I wonder if you have that kind of moment in your life. If there is one that should be, it should be salvation. Place, time, place, the context of the situation. And people get very upset when you ask them for their testimony and tell them about the importance of Romans 10, 9. From the heart, you say it out of your mouth. Time, place, scenario. They don't like that. They always like to say, I just always believed. I always had this in my life. How dare you question my salvation? Look, if salvation, I want to say this one thing. If salvation is the most important thing in your life, how can you forget? How can you forget one of the most important events in your life, what entailed there? And say, I just don't know. Now, um, I'm actually even addressing not just people online, but to all of you as well. All of you should look at your own lives and think about, hey, man, I mean, in my salvation, look, I'm not asking for every little detail, okay? No one can remember every little detail. But if salvation is the most important thing in your life, it was, if it was that meaningful, there should be, you should know an approximity of what entailed. Yeah. That's why we usually ask just an approximate yeah. time, yeah. approximate place, approximate Amen. context of the situation. Amen. And people make a big fuss about Romans 10, 9, confessing out of the mouth Come should on. not be salvation. I wonder if that person didn't really think salvation was that important to him or her. Mm. All right? And just waste time drawing on a whiteboard and then, you know, just brainwashes all the people on that one, the Bible believers on that. All right. Anyways, going back. All right. Genesis 32. Genesis chapter 32. So, it's not just salvation, that's just one example, but even your own life, right? You have to think about your own life. You ever had that? Yes. Maybe you need that. Yes. Maybe you need that. Uh, the Great Awakening Revivals, they definitely had that. Every, a lot, I can tell you for a fact, majority of the people in that church during the Great Awakening Revivals, they'll tell you time, place, and situation where they met God at His house, Amen. and they wept and made supplication. But nowadays, churches don't have that, let alone their salvation. Uh, Even their salvation shows how much the, they're very close to God, how God meant to them. Right. Must be the world that meant so much to, more to them, and that's why they're wasting so much time in the world and mixing the world in the church. All right, going back. The passage right here in verse 29, and Jacob asked him and said, I, uh, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? So notice right here, God does not give his name to Jacob. Now, why is that? Because of Exodus. Uh, we're going to look at two cases right here. We're going to go to the book of Exodus first, chapter 3. We're going to go to the book of Exodus. And then chapter 3. Then I'm going to give you, then I got to comment my most favorite Part, all right, that wasn't the most interesting one. The most interesting one was the other part, so I'm going to get there soon. Exodus chapter 3. Let me get this over with quickly. All right, let's go to Exodus 3. Now, notice what God says in verse 14, uh, verse 13 through 14. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. You know what God says? And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? Now, why would uh, Moses ask that if he already knew God's name? Why? We know his name. Uh, I mean, so many, so much we can call him. Jehovah, Jesus, etc., etc. 
But uh, why didn't Moses know, right? So then there's a reason behind that, because God never gave his name back then until now. So the very next verse, verse 14, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Verse 15, God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So God never revealed it until then. Until then. So God says, Now everyone will know. Go to Judges 13. Judges 13. Notice the tendency of God when he manifests himself as the angel of the Lord, is that he won't give his name. Notice he repeated the same thing with Manoah. With Manoah. Notice right here in Judges chapter 13, and then we'll read verse, let's see right here, 17, 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? Verse 18. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name? Seeing it is what? Secret. How about that? All right, go back. Go back to Genesis 32. Go back to Genesis 32. He wants to keep it to himself. So that's what God did. As a that was his tendency as the angel of the Lord in front of people. Why? You can't look at the face of God, let alone his name, and live. How about that, right? So that's how much sacred God uh, doesn't want to reveal his name or his own face and etc. Wow. Wow. We have to realize that. That's, that's how much God holds it very sacred. All right, Genesis 32. Now, the fun part. What in the world is that? I looked up all over, all right? Hollow of Jacob's thigh, which the sinew which shrank. So, I... Uh, I looked at the scholars, what they had to say. Because scholars have all the answer, right? Seminaries have all the answer. I looked it up. They all said that it's a sciatic nerve or whatever they call it. I'm like, well, that, well, that, that was very helpful. <laughs> it didn't say that. Dr. Ruckman argued that uh, I never read nerve right here. It said sinew. So then the scholars, they're wrong. But... Again, if you're higher educated, like you're going to get something right, okay? People believe what the scholar says, not because of their complete truth, but because of their partial statement that has partial truth. So because it sounds true, they believe it, but they don't look at, they're too lazy to look at the rest of the stuff, right? That's the reason why. So their statement uh, the scholars, what they stated is true, actually, but uh, it, the Bible never said nerve. Because then it makes it untrue. Uh, I studied the Jews as well. It is very true. There are some Jews, okay, if not a lot of them, that practice that. They, uh, they believe that a certain muscle part uh, where the sciatic nerve can be located where they don't eat because that's where God touched. But the King James Bible translators put hollow, they put thigh, and they claim the sinew that shrank. All right. So it's not just touching a nerve and then it became, you know, uh, it became paralyzed. That's what all the scholars assume. No, I believe what the word of God says, that it went out of joint. That was a hollow of a thigh and that the sinew literally shrank. So then I'm like, then how do you explain that? Well, again, read the verses as they say. There's your answer. And then when you research it, you'd be surprised. Now, the first thing is this. The issue is the sinew that shrank, right? Muscle shrinks. Now, this is very true. If you have, uh, I think you uh, call it muscle atrophy, you know, or something like that. When a muscle shrinks, here, uh, well, I'll just put it like that. At a muscle shrink, so to speak, I'll just put layman's terms. What can happen is that then certain parts of the body will be hard to move. So that makes sense if the muscle shrinks. That's why Jacob couldn't move the leg, right? He halted upon his thigh. 
But still it's not enough of an answer because the Bible says uh, where he, uh, what, what do you explain about the hollow of his thigh? If you just say the sinew, then that would make more sense. And then he shrunk it, but he put hollow of his thigh. Another thing is this. It's not just he was crippled, it was out of joint. All right, now I looked up everywhere. I can't find that anywhere, okay? You don't just get a muscle out of joint by, you know, when you, ha when you have the sciatic nerve or when you get paralyzed or when the muscle shrinks. So I'm like, okay, then I got to read the Bible. All right, the sinew shrank. But then I got to take every word as it says. He touched the what? It says hollow of his what? Thigh. Okay, so I looked it up. You know, the hollow of the thigh. Okay? Then when I looked it up, there are some people who will claim that God touched his groin area. And I'm like, yeah, you know. The reason why I didn't believe that is, one, scholars always have a tendency to put something grotesque in the passage in Genesis to prove their argument. Like, you know, when Abraham's servant touched his uh, leg, they will claim it's within the groin area. And then so because of their, uh, their, my previous mistrust of them in history, and his, uh, history proves itself right, you never trust the scholars. So I didn't trust them on that one. Okay, so I don't think it was that grotesque. Then it just dawned on me, which should be a dumb moment, so hollow of Jacob's thigh. So then I was thinking, what's hollow in the thigh? And then, you know, just typing it out, there is a thigh bone. And there is a part in the thigh bone that's hollow. I forgot what you call it, uh, femoral art or something, but it's right here, okay? And this is the thigh, actually, in the Bible. That's where Abraham's servant touched uh, Abraham, too, the thigh. It's right here, this location. The thigh bone, there is this bone right here, and it's the main bone you use for running, walking, and everything. He touched that. So the Bible, I take it literally as it says. Now, do you realize that this is before a human anatomy in your Bible? Oh, amen. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Bible is scientific. Amen. That should be evidence. Like, God knew inside the body, because he created that body, hey, that thigh bone is hollow. Yeah. I'm going to touch it right there. I mean, do you think KJV translators were human an anatomists and scientists? Come on, why would they translate like that unless it's God's word and they took it seriously and they said, well, I'm going to translate it like this because it says hollow, it says thigh. I don't get it, but that's the correct translation. Wow. Wow. That's good. God touched it right there. And obviously you have that muscle there that it's all relying on. When he touched the hollow of his thigh, that muscle shrank. That's why he couldn't walk on his leg. But then the problem is this. How do you, uh, that doesn't explain out of joint though. Just because the muscle shrinks, that doesn't mean it just goes out of joint. Right. Then when I was reading the passage again, I realized, oh, you idiot. Just read it as it says. Okay. Don't jump the gun. Come on. The Bible never said that God made it out of joint. Mm -hmm. It just said he touched the hollow of his thigh. What made it out of joint? Read verse 25. 25. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he made Jacob's thigh out of joint. No. He touched the hollow of his thigh. Okay. Once he touched that, where the sinew shrank, right? The sinew is that muscle, that stuff. All right. Uh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. See, I don't have to tell you. You guys are KJV Bible believers. You can figure it out for yourselves. As he wrestled with them. That's true when I study it. When I said, how do you get dislocation? It's not just some, something traumatic. They also said that it can, uh, it's through uh, using it. When your, muscle, uh, when your muscle shrinks and then you tend to keep using it, it can go out of joint. Now, like, oh, that makes sense. Because see, when he shrinks the muscle, Jacob's got to let go. God was testing Jacob. God's like, okay, you're going to get out of joint if you keep wrestling with me. Your muscle shrunk. You better let me go. Jacob's like, 
I'm not going to let you go. Even if you're broken? Yes, Lord, even if it breaks me. All right, then you're going to get broken. Crack. Man. 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 Yeah, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. By the way, you, they didn't read verse 32, okay? They didn't read verse 32, all right? So I, it's not like all in the same. I was thinking hollow of the thigh is the same thing as the sinew, but no, they're both different, okay? And they're, look, at the, uh, look how God touched it. Verse 32, Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the what? Sinew which shrank, which is what? Up on the hollow of his thigh. So here's the hollow of his thigh right here. And that's why the Jews don't eat that part over here. That made sense. So it's this part that went out of joint. So the hollow of his thigh, but that sinew which is up on the hollow of that thigh bone. That's why the Jews don't eat that. Now it made sense. The scholars, the Jews, had something right, but it, see, like I told you, they just only showed you broken parts of picture. Yeah. They didn't show you the whole part. Right. That's what God did. So God just touched it right here, the hollow of his thigh. Bam! And then that sinew shrank. Oh, that's good. Why? I don't know. Maybe because it was hollow. Maybe he could travel the energy there or something. I don't know. But he touched it right there, the hollow of his thigh, and then that sinew part, which is true. There's a sinew on the up part of that uh, thigh bone, which is hollow. And then if this one shrinks, and then that part is all messed up, and then it falls out of joint through pressure, no wonder it happened to Jacob. Yeah. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, and thank you so much for the truth of thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.